Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody. I'm Dr. Eliza Chin. I'm Executive Director of the American Medical Women's Association. Um, we have a very special event today. Hopefully, this is just going to be the first of many. And I wanted to thank um, all of our leaders here for joining us for this event and hope um, you all gain a lot of useful information. So um, with that, I just wanted to share a little bit. American Medical Women's Association launched an uh, IMG, International Medical Graduate Initiative, um, gosh, I think it's about two years now. And so from that, we've learned a lot and really grown a wonderful community within AMWA and looking to partner with many of you. So with that, I'm going to pass the microphone over um, to Dr. Douglas Chin. Welcome, Salam, Salam Atashid. As my man Douglas Chin asked, man Dr. Astam Dar Amri Kazande Gimikonam, Salam Atashid. So I want to keep my comments very uh, short and brief because um, we have very limited amount of time. And I want the lion's share of that time to go to these really outstanding panelists who are each true experts in what they're going to be talking about. But briefly, my name is Douglas Chin. I'm a physician located in Oakland, California. Um, but for the past five years, and especially the last two years, my real passion and heart have been with the people and nation of Afghanistan. I've been extremely involved in first in the evacuations, now the migration and resettlement of Afghans since uh, July 2021. And in addition, I run an online medical clinic for Afghans in Afghanistan and also at various stages of their migration. Many of you out there are doctors that have gotten to work alongside in the context of that clinic. And I am just so impressed with all of you. So I know firsthand what exceptional human beings and what exceptional doctors, nurses, therapists, um, and other healthcare professionals all of you are. And I know firsthand, I know that the American medical community would benefit greatly from having you there. And so that's why I've uh, really um, chosen to help organize this uh, clinic. Thank you to all of the guests on this uh, panel and your respective organizations. So I don't wanna waste any more of your time. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna um, hand this over now to our first speaker sure. who is- I just, one more quick thing. So for logistics, if you have any questions, feel free to at any point in time to put questions in the Q&A. Um, we also have the chat open if you like to share things, but if you have questions, best to put them in the Q&A. I also wanted to thank OET, Occupational English Test, for um, sponsoring and supporting this event. And we'll hear more from them later. Thank you. Back to and you. one last comment that this uh, session is being recorded. Uh, your names, identities, contact information will be hidden as you know it's a webinar, so I don't think you have to be concerned about that. But just to let you know, the session is recorded. Uh, so I'm going to hand this off now to Dr. Sheila Toro, who is the chair of the International Medical Graduate Committee of the American Medical Women's Association. So, Dr. Toro. Hi, everyone. Uh, one second to share my screen. Can you see it? Perfect. Okay. Uh, perfect. If you want to go to slideshow though, yeah. Perfect. Oh, it's okay. okay. Um, hello everyone. My name is Sheila Toro. I'm an international medical graduate that a lot of you and I'm from Venezuela. Uh, currently I'm working as a clinical research assistant in Rush University in Chicago. And I'm also, as Dr. Shin mentioned, I'm was IMG initiative chair. Um, don't worry about taking notes. I will pass the slides. So after the event is finished, you will receive the slides and you can go into the details. And also I took the liberty of including some lessons that I've learned through this process. So I hope this helped you. Okay, first starting, I would like to clarify what is an IMG. Uh, we are individuals who received our medical degree from a medical school located outside the United States. This is important because it is the location of the medical school, but not the citizenship of the individual, what determines whether if we are or not IMGs. And the lesson number one, don't underestimate the difficulty of communicating in a language other than your native tongue. This is true for people like me who came from a country where I speak another language, and I guess for a lot of you too. So don't underestimate it. Uh, however, good news, you're already here, you're understanding what I say. So that's way better place to start from where I actually began. So congratulations. Okay, now um, to be a physician in the US, you will need to complete your residency. 
even though if you already are a specialist in your home country, you will need to do it again. Uh, the good news about it is that there are programs denominated IMG friendly, who actually think that this is a good thing because you're already trained. So there is a lot of things that you can do, I mean, comparing to someone who didn't have that training. Um, however, you need to be clear that there is also something called cap year since graduation. Some programs take from two to 12 years in my experience. So when you graduated more than that amount of years um, from med school, it could be something that they call a red flag. You don't get scared about it. As I said before, it's not, it's not something bad, but people, you, you need to be aware of that. Um, now, for applying to residency, you will need some requirements. You can see it here on the slides. The biggest one is the ECFNG certification. Um, you will need letters of recommendations and you will need your CV, uh, your medical student performance evaluation from your home college and a photo. Now, optional, but it's good to have, especially because for us IMGs, this is the way that we get the letters of recommendations, is the UL clinical experience and research experience. I will talk a little bit more in depth uh, in the few next minutes. Now, before you start you know, the process to get your ECFMG certification, you need to check that your school is actually in the World Directory of Medical Schools. I went ahead and this is the list of Afghans uh, college that are listed in that uh, directory. So as I said, you will get the slides. You can go into detail and see if your school is listed there. Now, the application for ECF and G certification starts with filling the form 186. It must be completed notarized. You will send that to your school. Your school will send it back to ECF and G. Don't worry. It's, something that ECFMG will help you uh, with. Actually, they are pretty they are pretty helpful. Uh, if you email them or call them, they will guide you through the, the process. You also will need for your ECFMG certification, fulfill some examination requirements. These are the USMLE steps one or two, and you need to prove that you have clinical skills and communication skills. And for that, you will need to complete a DCFMG pathway and the occupational English test. But of course, Mr. Was is going to talk about the OET, that's the occupational English test. So I just will name it. Now, lesson number two. So focus on one thing at a time. You know, there's a lot of things that you will need to do and time is limited. So you might get diluted if you take too many, let's say, responsibilities. So try to focus on one thing at a time. If you're starting for step one, try to do that before moving to the next step. Uh, this will save you from doing too much and you know, without completing anything by the end. Now, the USMLE is the United States Medical Licensing Examination. This is a group of three tests that you will need to take. Step one, step two, CK, that's for clinical knowledge, and step three. However, to get your ECFMG certification and be able to um, participate in the residency match, that's the process through, uh, through which you go to residency, um, you will need to complete step one and step two CK. Also, a pathway in the OET, I already mentioned that. You will get your ACFMG certification, and then you will be qualified to take the step three. The good thing is that you can take the step three during your residency first year or before applying to the match. So you will take the steps in a Prometric Center. This is a company that is located all over the world. These are some of the countries. Sorry, this is the list of the countries where it's located. And these are the pathways. As I mentioned before, you'll need to fulfill the requirements for one of the pathways. You have six pathways. I won't go in deep over this. Actually, I'm not the best person about talk for talking about the pathways because in my experience, I took the step to CS that was before the pandemics. They changed it, so they replaced that test that it was a clinical skills test, test 
with these pathways. Um, what I can tell you is that, for example, from my country, from Venezuela, I've been talking with some colleagues and most of them have taken pathway one because it requires that you have a license in your country, in your home country. So if you, you in my case, in Venezuela, you do this through something called Physicians College. You will get a letter saying, you know, this person is licensed and you will go ahead. Lesson three, it will take time. So I know it's hard and you're in a present situation, but you will need to have some patience. And also you need to save because it's expensive. The whole process can be really expensive. Lesson four, resilience. So, you know, together resilience with perseverance, I will say that that's what distinguishes somebody who actually made it to the end, to the goal, and someone who, um, you know, have to leave, be leaving behind for, I don't know, say something. Anyways, um, yeah, I think definitively resilience, that the capacity that recover, of recover quickly from difficulties is something that you will need to practice. And you will get this by email when you're ready, when you're done with your steps. This is the ECFMG certification. This is something that people is so proud about getting this that actually they post picture of themselves on social media with this certificate. If you do that, please erase the numbers, you know, like the details, because again, that's sensitive information. But of course, you have the de the de uh, sorry the right to be proud about it because it was a lot of work. Now, uh, what I mentioned it was optional for IMGs, but again, this is how we get the letters of recommendation, so it's not that optional. Uh, it is is a U.S. clinical experience that can be uh, done through clerkships, but this is only for undergrads. So if you're already a doctor this is not for you but you can do observerships and then externships so the observerships you basically observe you shadow a doctor uh, during medical exam the whole procedures if they do some you know the the whole medical visit if it's outpatient um, we actually preparing the initiative this book that is in the right uh, upper corner is in the website. You, I will give you the link so you can actually download this if you're going to do an observership. It's a useful tool for you. And externships is actually a hands-on experience, so it's pretty valuable for us. Now, research experience. These are three kind of jobs. Those are entry-level jobs that you can get as a researcher, a research fellow, research assistant, and coordinator. And of course, volunteering. So as I said, it's optional, but it's good that you show if you have a passion that you show that you are actually committed to that. If you try to help people, if you want to help people, you can volunteer in different organizations, whatever you feel that your heart wants. This is a summary of the whole process. So as I told you, I will give you the slides. So don't worry about um, making any sense of this because it's, it's complex. But if you, you will need to sit up, uh, sorry, sit down and look carefully at every step. But it's basically a summary of what I already said. And this is the final lessons, networking. This is something that I learned kind of the hard way. I'm even though I'm talking here before you, I'm a shy person, so it was not easy for me. Americans are accustomed to network, and that is, you know, it, it goes not only through the professional kind of, you know, it's not only because of professional reasons. It can be all, also, and that's very true for us IMGs, is about building a community. So there is WhatsApp groups that you can join, Facebook groups, attend medical conferences, join medical organizations that align with your values, use social media. That is kind of, you know, there are basically rules about using social media, but try to be professional about it, but use social media to connect with people. And of course, and of course the good old email, reaching out to someone via email. These are the websites that I think that are more important for you to read <laughs> right now. Um, so you can visit those links. And that's it. Thank you so much.
Doug, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I just want to uh, make a quick note. I know that all of you are at very different stages of your journey. Some may be in the United States, some may be in other third countries. Some of you I, I know are actually still in Afghanistan. So, but we are going to be mentioning um, um, something for each of you, regardless of what stage you're in. Um, and I also want to say, so I was very, very lucky to have uh, Dr. Toro in my office for several months uh, as part of an observership. And if, if and when you guys make it to the United States, especially Northern California, would love to have you or at least help you find someone that you could observe. Uh, but next up, we have Makul Bakshi, who um, is the Chief Global Affairs Officer uh, for CGFNS International. And he's going to be speaking about licensure certification uh, requirements for nurses. So great. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, my name is Mukul Bakshi. I am the chief global affairs officer at CGFNS. And um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. Let me just get this up. All right. All right. Uh, so I, you know, want to kind of introduce first, you know, I, as Douglas just said, there's kind of everybody's on their own part of the journey and uh, CGFNS uh, is happy to assist regardless of where you are on that journey. So CGFNS uh, is, I know it's kind of an alphabet soup uh, of letters. It is uh, used to stand for the Commissioner on Graduates of Foreign Nursing Schools. So we do the credential evaluation uh, for nursing and allied health professionals, including physical therapists, occupational therapists, et cetera. And our goal and role is really to safeguard public safety uh, through the evaluation of professional credentials. Uh, and we play an important role in migration and licensing for those working in the US, of course, but also for Canada and New Zealand. Uh, and we have, as I mentioned, been around for 45 years. Uh, we are were founded by the American Nurses Association and the uh, National League for Nursing. Okay. And so there are multiple steps uh, really that are involved in practicing in, in the United States. So this is kind of a very high level simplistic uh, version of it. And some of your paths will be different based on, uh, you know, kind of where you're on the process and what are your particular circumstances. But I think this summarizes it well for, for a nurse, for example, who's uh, trying to come to the U.S. So you notice there's kind of two separate pathways. So one is for immigration, um, which is if you are looking to get an occupational visa, for example, based on your status as a nurse or another healthcare professional, uh, you need what's called a visa screen. And then separately, as a nurse, uh, you need a, what's called a credential evaluation service report or CES report for licensure. So let's talk about the process at a high level. So say you're trying to do both. Um, the first step in pretty much any visa is getting a background check when you apply. And this is done by the Department of Homeland Security in the United States. Uh, then talking about kind of the specifics around, uh, you know, the credential verification is we are verifying the, the credentials to make sure they're real and we're authenticating them. And so we get kind of three buckets of credentials, right? So one is um, educational and licensure documents. So uh, any transcripts uh, from schools, if you have any licenses, uh, we would get those as well. And they're coming from the primary source, like the registrar, or the licensing authority, and we're validating them to make sure that they're they're accurate. So either that means looking for signatures on the documents, if they're paper documents, if they're submitted digitally, then we of course have a digital pathway to make sure that they're accurate. For nurses, there's also a test of nursing knowledge. So this could be either the NCLEX, which is a requirement for licensure in most uh, US states as well as Canada, and or or the CGFNS qualifying exam, so an exam of nursing knowledge. And the third bucket is an English language proficiency examination. So that could be OET, of course, the sponsor of this event. It could also be IELTS, TOEFL, or a couple other tests. So those are the all the documents that we kind of bring in uh, to verify and authenticate what are, you have the credentials that you need uh, for licensure uh, to actually practice as a nurse or to get a visa. Uh, based on your status as a nurse. And then we have the credential evaluation. We look at all of those things and say, for immigration, 
do we issue what's called a visa screen certificate? As I mentioned, this is what you need uh, to get a visa based on your employment as a nurse or allied professional. And then separately, you would need a separate CES report, which is an advisory report. So kind of a report that goes through all your credentials and gives um, information to a state board of nursing, for example, to make a decision as to whether you get licensed. So those are kind of the two different paths. One is getting your visa to actually live in the United States, and the other is to get uh, a license to actually practice. Uh, and you'll notice that there's kind of two different things. So in the US, immigration, of course, is a federal policy. So that's handled by the federal government. And then the licensing, whether you can actually practice, is a state issue. I do want to also mention uh, a division of CGFNS uh, that I'm the director of, which is the Alliance for Ethical International Recruitment Practices. So the Alliance aims to ensure that uh, when nurses and other health professionals come to the United States uh, through a recruiter, that they're treated fairly and ethically. And so we have a code of ethical recruitment that we um, kind of explains what are the rights and responsibilities of you as a healthcare professional, uh, of the recruiters, and then the employers like a hospital or healthcare facility that you might work at. And this code is kind of best practices for those. We certify recruiters. We provide guidance for nurses about what their contract rights are, things of that sort. And so that is a resource uh, if you're looking to use that route. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a high level on, on the kind of trends around here is um, there's been a major increase in the number of health professionals that have come to the United States over the last few years um, in terms of the number of visa screen applications. This is the immigration one I mentioned. Uh, there are now about 18,000 a year. That's more than double what there were a few years ago. And we expect interest to come to the United States to increase both because of the, of the opportunities here and then the high demand for healthcare professionals from a, a career perspective. And uh, in terms of what are the visas people are coming under, most are coming under what are called green card visas, like EB, EB visas, they're called commonly. Um, that's the most common one. These are permanent uh, residency visas. Uh, and other categories, which are huge numbers, are clinical lab scientists, as well as uh, you know occupational therapists and physical therapists. Uh, in terms of where uh, nurses are coming from, you'll see that you know the vast majority still are the Philippines. Uh, other countries include uh, you know Canada, people who are educated in the U.S. but are from abroad, and then um, some African and Asian countries. You'll notice Afghanistan is not on this list. Uh, we we receive a handful of applications from Afghani educated nurses at this time. Uh, so in terms of what are some of the issues, obviously, uh, if you're in the United States, there's less of an issue with the immigration path pathway. But for those of you who are uh, looking for uh, an immigration based on your status as a nurse, uh, there are visa backlogs, there are long wait times and things of that sort. As I mentioned before, when you're looking to work in the United States, you need to consider kind of two things. One is how would you get authorization to immigrate to the United States? And from a career perspective, um, how do I get a license to practice my profession? So both of those are really important. And I think it's really great that um, this webinar is there to kind of talk through both parts of that. And then finally, I know we're talking about a lot about employer employment-based visas, like um, people are coming under based on nurses. I know for some Afghanis, um, they're coming under humanitarian parole or, or refugee visas as well. Uh, and I wanted to note that, as I mentioned before, we usually get our documents directly from uh, a nursing uh, school, for example, or a licensing authority. Uh, if you are a refugee or have similar status, uh, we can work with you uh, if you can't access those primary source documents. So in that case, we can do some things uh, to try to rebuild your transcripts, for example, if they're not accessible, so that you can still go through that process for either immigration or for licensure. So uh, anyway, I do want to thank um, everyone for organizing this event. Uh, and my fellow panelists and all of you for being here. I think this will be a very informative uh, discussion. And if you do have questions, uh, you know, you can of course reach out to me by email at um, uh, cgfns.org. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Muckle. That, uh, Muckle, that was that was a wonderful talk. I should have given you guys an all an overview, but I think uh, Muckle touched on this, that really there are two things to consider. One is what the professional requirements are going to be for you to actually get licensed and practice your, 
your your um, profession when, when you come to the United States. But the other thing that might be of more importance to you guys is depending on where you are in the journey now, whether you're in a third country or still in Afghanistan, um, how you get to the United States, what the visa pathways. But it's important to understand what the licensure requirements are because that is going to influence what kind of a visa you're gonna be able to get or qualify for. So we're starting off with what the licensure requirements are for you know doctors, nurses, and then next, um, we're going to talk about other professions. And then we have a really great attorney, uh, actually, then the English requirements. And then we have a really great attorney who's going to actually talk about the various uh, visa pathways. So just to give you that overview. So thank you, Mavo. The next, we have Tamar Fredrikstein Apple, who is the Senior Employment Services Advisor and Healthcare Career Community Lead for an organization, a wonderful organization called Upwardly Mobile. And Tamar is going to be talking about licensure requirements for other healthcare professionals. So take it away, Tamar. So before I start my presentation, I just wanted to mention Upwardly Global's website. It's upwardlyglobal.org. Um, and we are a program uh, a little dissimilar to what, what Mukul talked about. Um, we work with immigrants and refugees who are already in the U.S. So folks who have come here um, many, many Afghans who've come here on that in that refugee or um, parole status, and um, also folks who um, who are here as immigrants, a variety of ways. So my, our work really focuses on once you are here in the U.S. and you have work um, work a work visa have. Uh, status to work, then we provide support and career coaching. So that's uh, a very high level uh, uh, mention of what we do. Um, since I don't have a lot of time, I'm not going to go into more details, but I want to encourage you to uh, check out our website and um, and I will stick my email in the chat if people have questions at the end. Um, okay, so uh, you got great overviews on nursing and and doctors that want to relicense. Um, I am going to say uh, that uh, ten minutes isn't going to be enough time to cover all the other um, all the other areas. So I'm going to do a high level overview of some of the things you should think about, and then um, encourage you. To, to do some research and, and reach out with more questions. So every area of healthcare in the US is highly, highly regulated. So even folks with medical degrees cannot walk into a hospital and say, I practiced medicine for 10 years. I wanna be a nurse. I wanna be a medical assistant. Even I wanna be a phlebotomist sometimes. They need to get certification. Certifications and licensure happens at the state level in the United States. So every state has a different uh, different set of rules. So it's really confusing. Um, if you go to the um, website of the state government where you're located, um, they often have a, um, a professional regulation board, a medical board, a nursing board, even that differs, but that's where you can find more information. Um, I want to also encourage you to think about a pathway in your careers. I, I saw some comments um, about opportunities. You know, if you're a medical assistant, does that start? Does that help for clinical experience? The answer can be yes, um, and it can be a great way to just get um, get familiar with the U.S. Um, work style with healthcare in the U.S. Um, so if you start as a medical assistant or a certified nurse assistant, that doesn't mean that's where you're going to stop. That just is where you're starting. Um, and then also to explore certification programs at local community colleges, because they can be really um, well aligned with needs in your community. So um, Instead of going into any of the details about what it means to license as a vet or a dentist or a pharmacist, I couldn't do that. Um, once again, I, I want you to think about doing some research, but one of the things that we like to talk about is as you're starting to get that U.S. experience, as Dr. Toro talked about, 
being patient and 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 building your network and getting U.S. experience. Um, some of the fields that we find really open and less regulated than working as a clinical doctor or a nurse or any of those other areas can be clinical research. As Dr. Toro mentioned, really valuable if you are applying for residency, but also can be a really satisfying career um, and, 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 and provide growth and is less regulated. Um, also public health. I work with many um, uh, Afghan professionals who were trained as doctors, but also who worked in the public health infrastructure, who worked with international organizations like USAID and WHO. Um, and that is also a pathway to do program management, um, monitoring and evaluation, bring those public health skills to the US also less um, less regulated, um, allied health. So some of those jobs like um, technicians, radiology techs, um, sonography techs, um, uh, medical assistants, all these allied health um, pathways can be a really great way to start on your, um, on your career, get connected to healthcare in the U.S., um, build your network, uh, build your knowledge of of uh, of English, especially related to healthcare, um, and then um, help you. And then, oftentimes within hospital systems, there are HR resources to help you um, help you advance professionally to get more certifications, get more training. So, allied health can be a great great way to go. Um, and you know, as we know. Um, they're really satisfying um, professional careers for nurses, for technologists that can make good livings and, and really be engaged. Um, nurses work at all levels of, of healthcare in the U.S. and do a lot of leadership um, and have lots of options. So I encourage you to think about that. And then for those of you who have administrative um, experience, healthcare administration is also a viable pathway. Um, I was asked to say a little bit about alternative licensure. So um, this is a pathway that is, is coming into, um, into existence as, as we speak. Um, it happens at the state level, although I'm going to make quick mention of some national um, national legislation that's being um, supported and discussed. But um, the things you should know about this is as it's evolving, it often requires an employer to sponsor. So um, I work in the state of Illinois, and we are working now to um, to um bring to fruition our uh, limited licensure law. And um, once we have the rules written, the next step will be to build relationships with employers so they know how to access folks who are doing this. I do know of folks, um, New York has had a limit, it's called the limited permit for a long time. And, and, and there are employers there who are looking for doctors who are ECFM, G certified, but have not yet um, done residency who would take a job under a limited permit. Um, Washington state also has a law. Um, and as I said, three states have passed legislation this year and are currently um, in the rulemaking. That's Illinois, Tennessee, and Colorado. There are other states working on this because we know in the US, we simply do not have enough doctors. We are not, we have huge, huge gaps in what we're going to need as our population ages. And we really, really need um, the expertise and training that you all bring. So um, stay tuned. This is an evolving um, place, um, but really, really important work. And um, really glad to be able to share that there is, there are, hopefully will be more pathways for IMGs and other medical protectors professionals. Um, so as I mentioned, Illinois, we had a number of 
of, of, of victories. So just an example, one is this limited license that they're writing the rules for now. And the second one is our state is gonna develop, is, is creating an ombudsman in the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation to help IMGs navigate the relicensing process. So acknowledging that this is a complicated process and, um, and wanting to support folks in all, uh, in all professional areas. So really excited about that. Um, here's some federal legislation. So these bills are at the national level. The, they've been introduced in Congress to support international medical grads, immigrants in nursing and allied health, and then professionals access to Health Workforce Integration Act. So this, these conversations are happening and we're really just so excited and hopeful that um, our country writ large will figure out a better way to um, employ and, and utilize um, amazing immigrant and refugee healthcare professionals who are here and who are arriving every day. So I think I will leave it at that. Um, and I'll take a look at some of the questions. Once again, upwardlyglobal.org is our website. We have some licensing guides there and other resources that could be very, very, um, very, very helpful. And I'll put my email in the chat. Thank you so much, Tamar. That was a fantastic talk, great overview. I know that a lot of you are doctors wondering how you become a doctor, um, you know, a, with a, a full-fledged medical license uh, coming to the United States. But these, that with stuff that Tamar's talking about really offer fantastic potential pathways. So for example, you can't come here initially practicing as a doctor, but maybe you can come here as, you know, first as a surgical tech or medical assistant. In fact, I will share an experience that there's a surgery center in New York that has created a special a, a medical specialist for specifically for Muslim women with the intention of hiring this person, an Afghan doctor from, from uh, Kabul, will then come over here, become trained and work as a surgical tech as she studies for the medical boards and becomes and gets her medical uh, license. So, um, and Spojmi is gonna be talking about some of those visa pathways um, at the last part of this uh, session. So next I wanna hand this over to uh, Jack Wass, who is the US um, occupational, uh, occupational specialist uh, for the occupational English test. Oh, you're on, you're on mute, uh, Jack. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, yes, thank you for the introduction. My name is Jack Waz, I'm an education specialist um, for, for OET. Um, so as you heard already on this call, OET can be used by both doctors and nurses um, that are hoping to, to get certified to work in the United States and also for immigration purposes. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how what that looks like and some of the specifics there. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen first. Give me one second. Okay, um, so, so starting out, um, first just to mention that OET is the only English language test designed specifically for healthcare professionals, um, which kind of speaks to how relevant um, it is to the healthcare context and how it can be used for these different um, immigration and certification purposes. So the first thing I want to mention is the rationale for creating an English language test specifically for healthcare professionals. Um, so here are some of the issues in healthcare that OAT was designed to address. The first one, as was already mentioned a couple of times on this call, is the shortage of skilled healthcare prof professionals in English speaking countries. Secondly, the pressure being put on healthcare systems by aging populations, the increased consumer expectation and a focus on patient centered care. And lastly, the high cost of communication errors in healthcare. So as healthcare professionals, obviously we are aware of, of what that looks like and, and how expensive and, and costly those can be. So when looking at all these points, you can see the need for trained healthcare professionals in an English speaking context and start to understand how OET can help prepare healthcare professionals to meet these needs. All right, so now that we know why OET was developed, let's talk a little bit about what a health specifically, a test rather, specifically for a healthcare professional means. So the first thing is that it's developed in consultation with subject matter experts 
meaning that the content is relevant and specific to a healthcare context and is reviewed for relevance by licensed healthcare professionals in each country where the test operates. So for example, the nursing version of OET is reviewed by a registered nurse who also writes items for the test on an ongoing basis and the same thing for OET medicine. Second, um, test materials replicate the language skills required to deliver patient safety and quality care, and candidates learn the type of language they'll need at work. All this to say that prepping for and taking OET will help candidates develop skills they will need on the job. So here are two examples to illustrate how OET is different from other general English tests on the market. So the first thing you can see here is for the writing portion of OET. So in a general or academic writing test, um, you might be asked to write an essay on a general topic, um, something that has to do with transportation or geology or architecture. Whereas with OET, you'll be asked to write a healthcare letter, either a discharge summary or referral letter to another healthcare professional. For speaking, which is another example I have here, um, again, for a general academic uh, English test, Candidates are asked to participate in a structured interview on a general topic, whereas with OET, candidates are asked to take the role of a healthcare professional in a role play with a patient, where they'll be having the type of conversation they might have on a daily basis with, with patients. Just to quickly cover um, what's included in the test, um, OET is comprised of four subtests, including listening, reading, writing, and speaking. The writing and speaking subtest include profession-specific content. So for example, a doctor taking OET will be presented with a medicine-specific writing and speaking test, whereas the listening and reading subtests are of general healthcare content, so applicable to all healthcare professionals. All right, so as you can see on this slide, um, OET is accepted by regulators internationally for nursing, medicine, and for immigration purposes. Um, so for doctors, OET is the only English language test accepted by ECFMG, and it's in its fourth year of being the means for demonstrating English proficiency for the match, right? So it's required for all international medical graduates who want to practice in, in the United States. And for nursing, OET is recognized by HRSA and CGFNS, and can also be used to attain the visa screen certificate. So it can be used for both licensing and for immigration purposes. To talk a little bit more about nursing, um, so I want to, th this map here demonstrates specifically where OET can be used for nursing in the United States. Um, so using OET to demonstrate English proficiency, there is a means to apply for state license or visa screen in 37 states. In some of those states, the application needs to be made via CGSNS when you apply for your credentialing service and the OET results need to be sent to CGFNS as well. Um, to find more information about where OET is accepted, um, both for medicine and for nursing and all the other professions um, that OET um, supports, um, you can go to the Who Recognizes OET section of our website. Um, I'll be sharing the links in the chat um, after I finish um, my presentation so you can find all the information there. Um, and kind of just to summarize here, um, OET can be used for a variety of healthcare professions um, from, from nursing to medicine, um, and it also can be helpful in preparing for NCLEX, for example, right? Nurses that are preparing for NCLEX really need that clinical knowledge and some of that medical terminology that is also covered in OET. So wherever you are in your healthcare um, journey or your migration journey, um, OET can be a, a good resource for you to prepare um, to become certified and, and to migrate. Um, so lastly, I have my email listed here, um, jack.waz at oet.usa.com. I can also put that in the chat after I finish um, presenting in case anyone has any follow-up questions or would like some more information. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Jack. That was a great talk. So, I mean, that is so foundational is, is, um, is preparing for the English test, right, Jack? So, and I really appreciate the fact that you guys are doing this because, you know, speaking uh, medical English is very different from just being, you know, fluent in English period. So the fact that you can create these occupation specific pathways is just fantastic, Jack. So thank you guys. Thank you so much for your organization. Next, we have Spojmi Nasiri, who is a really talented, um, just luminary, um, fantastic hero of an immigration attorney um, and who's been, who helped 
who has been helping out quite a bit in this effort. So thank you. Um, and um, Spoojmi is going to be talking about different visa pathways, different immigration pathways. So Spoojmi. Uh, thank you very much for the kind words, Dr. Chen. Assalamu uh, alaikum, salamana, demanim spagmina sirida, zidi kadwala wakila pa California kiam, zidi immigration pa barakin and khabarikum. Assalamu alaikum, nomim aspojmai na siris, ma wakila sum da amrika, da California asta, ma da barai immigration gap mezanum, ke kodam option asta, ke ba warum in jaba medical field in jabia and uh, I will be speaking in English. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Boj Minasiri. I am an immigration attorney in California. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with everyone. Um, it's very complex, whether we're talking about immigration or licensing or any of those requirements. So I wanted to keep it very, give the basic information, but then try to keep it simple in terms of the criteria. Again, as my co-panelists stated, this, this um, presentations or this is recorded and the presentations are available for you. Um, right off the bat, um, as you know, since the fall of uh, Afghanistan in 2021, 2021 uh, there's been a lot going on both here in, in the United States and also in trying to get Afghans evacuated. So um, although I'm knowledgeable about the topics I'm talking about, I've done these cases. At uh, this time, I'm not able to take on any of new of these cases. If someone is able or interested in hiring an attorney, I can certainly refer to, to another attorney uh, to be able to do that. So primarily the ways that someone can migrate to the United States is either through a J-1, F-1, EB-3, and H-1B. Now, although in reality these options are available, um, it has been very difficult and challenging not only for Afghans, but for any nationality to be able to obtain the credentials and be able to come here. As my co-panelists already talked about, they talked extensively about the different requirements that come together as a package in order to be able to migrate. So my slides are mainly to talk about the different options. You might've heard of J-1, you might've heard of F-1, H-1B. So I kind of want to give an overview of what these options are. And if you want to get in more into it, and the USCIS immigration website has detailed information. So as an international student planning to study abroad, there are different types of options and the most common are F1 for student visas and also um, sorry, um, J1 visas. So the differences primarily between F1 and J1 um, are that they have different requirements in terms of the conditions the benefits, and so I'm gonna kind of get into that. Sorry, Dr. Chen, I'm trying to get my slide to go. Okay, wait, uh, oh, there we go, I just have to click on it. I have a MacBook and I'm using a different. So J-1 is also known as an exchange visit visa or J student visa for anyone who's outside of the United States and they wanna do work related in exchange program approved by the Department of Education and Cultural Affairs. Typically, a J-1 um, is you know, sponsored by an education or a nonprofit institution. That's really important to keep in mind because the differences in an F-1 is you don't have to be sponsored by any um, educational, educational or nonprofit or institution. So some types, of, um, some types of options that are available for uh, qualifying for a J-1 are secondary school students, uh, physicians, professors, research, short-term scholars, trainees, and interns. So if you're at a different level of your career, some of these might be an option for you if you meet all the requirements. So the how long you can stay in a J-1 depends on the length of the program. So if a program is gonna go for a year and maybe it'll get extended, then you are able to, you know, if this school allows it, you might be able to extend it beyond that. So over the last two years with the fall of Kabul to the Taliban, I have seen, uh, you know, quite a few, not a whole lot, but a few individuals come here on a J-1. And J-1 has a two-year residency requirement. So you have to finish your training and then go back to your home country. Um, there are certain waivers that you can request for the J-1 uh, to be able to overcome the two-year requirement. 
So again, the duration depends on how long your program is and if you're able to extend, extend it beyond that time. Um, one of the important questions that a lot of my J1 uh, clients ask me is, you know, I have to work in the United States. I have to do my credential. I have to spend some money to Afghanistan. Um, I have a lot of obligations and all of this. So the good news is on a J1, students are permitted to work and they can also work uh, longer hours when they're not in there, when they're on a, a break or some sort. So a, again, a J1 gives you the ability to not only do the program, but also be able to work. So one of the things about the J1 is that the sponsor has to come from the accredited school. They have to, to fund your program. So it cannot be like your money that you have or your family that's going to support you. The whole point of it is a training. So the institution has to be able to provide you uh, with 50% of the funds for the program. Uh, as it was talked about by my panelists, you also have to meet the English proficiency requirements and you have to maintain medical insurance. Now, Dr. Chen, I don't know if like when you come on these programs, if the schools themselves provide the med medical insurance as part of the package or the person has to get it individually. But in terms of immigration, you do have to maintain insurance, medical insurance. And so you have to comply with the requirements of whatever the J-1 program admission is. And again, uh, you must return to your home country for at least two years. So in some circumstances, for example, even prior to the fall of Kabul, uh, when um, people came on a J-1, um, they weren't able to adjust their status because they had to meet the requirement for the two year going back to your home country. There are waivers available. Um, sometimes people are not able to find a job but they wanna apply for asylum um, because they're afraid to go back to their home country like Afghanistan or somewhere. You can do a waiver of the two year and continue a different pathway, but the restrictions are there and you must apply for the waiver. And you have to have a valid passport and you have to maintain full enrollment in the academic program. So you can't just come on a J-1 and then just say, well, I'm going to stop going to the program. Um, you must continue your requirements for, for that. And then the work restrictions, again, as I mentioned, you can work part-time while you're in the program. If you're on a break, you can work uh, part-time, full-time. So I don't wanna to get too much into the requirements that are here. There are various forms that have to be filed, application process. I have the website, which gives you extensive step-by-step -step process on what's required for a J-1. Um, and so on the J-1, uh, these are just details about the sponsor, which forms you need to. So for a sponsor, there are um, designated sponsors that you can you know, that participate in the J-1 program. And there's a link there in blue that when you look at the slide, you can click on that and take you to the different various programs that you can apply to. And then the DS2019 is one of the many forms that have to be completed. Aside from the program, there are multiple fees for the application uh, that you either have to pay or if the institution that's gonna sponsor you might help you pay for it. Uh, so there are various fees that are involved in this process and you have to be able to be ready to pay for these costs if the institutions are not that you're applying to are not going to be um, able to, to do that. There may be some fee waivers, which means you don't have to pay, but a lot of these, um, if they don't have a fee waiver, the institution is not going to pay for it. You will have to pay to continue with the program. So as my co-panelist said earlier, this process is very rigorous. Um, it's time consuming and it's also expensive, unfortunately. And then, you know, at the last step, you'll have to schedule the interview. And when you attend the interview, they ask you various questions like, why did you choose your study of area? How do you plan on making your education further? Um, you know, they may ask questions about your parents' profession, who's gonna pay for part of your education? Do you plan to return back to your home country? So that's one of the toughest questions that we have, both for F1 and J1. When you go to the interview at the consulate, the, you, the consulate officer has to believe you. And the problem with Afghanistan is that many people get this and they're you know, not able to return back. So 
the burden is on the applicant to show that they intend to return. And when I talk about the F-1 visas, we've seen that be an issue, particularly in Islamabad, where they're questioning their intent. Because remember, these are non-immigrant visas, meaning you're coming temporarily to the US, but you plan on returning back to your, your country. And you have to overcome that burden. Whereas an immigrant visa, which is a green card visa, you're coming in and you're staying in the US. So we've run into some issues on the J-1 and maybe after my talk, if any of the panelists have had issues with their clients or somebody that they're helping, were you able to overcome that issue? I know I did a couple of uh, doctors in Turkey on CARA and we had to overcome the J-1 to show that they intended to return. In that instance, that individual, we proved that they could go back to Turkey um, and they were able to get their J-1 and then they applied for asylum and they went through the rest of the process. So some of these are so some of these are the challenges besides all of the other requirements that you have to meet um, to come in, you know, to the US on a J-1. Now, the F-1 student visa is the second option that somebody can come in. And so one of the things people are calling me, whether it's from Afghanistan or from the, you know, other parts of the world is, I wanna come study in the United States. Well, that's great. The, the problem is with the F, not the problem, but the challenge with the F-1 student is, is that you have to meet the requirements. So if I'm in the United States and I wanna to apply to apply for a school, I have to meet certain requirements. If you wanna to go to college, university, community college, that's the same requirement for international students. So one of the great things about the F-1 student visa is, is that even a lot of the community college, which is like not very expensive to go to, because they want international students, um, and you're able, if you meet the requirements for the F-1 student visa, and they, you know, you have to go to the website for a particular school. So if you're in Cal, you wanna to come to California and you wanna study at a certain school, what you wanna do is you wanna to go to their website and look up the information for their international student program. And it'll tell you exactly what you need. So if you call a lawyer like me and say, oh, Spoj might help me uh, find a school. I, I'm not going to be able to help you, no lawyer. You have to be able to find a school that you wanna to go to and then retain an attorney and say, well, I found the school I'm interested in um, and you may be able to do that. And so once you pick a school, then there's various forms you have to file and all of that and you have to do all of the requirements, uh, English proficiency, you have to show that you have funding, you have to pay for it yourself, unless it's some school that's gonna give you a scholarship, which is uh, very difficult to get. And you have to have a valid passport. And again, the last one is home country residency. We've seen a lot of issues, particularly at the US Embassy in Islamabad, where the applicant has to overcome that, hey, I'm just gonna go to the United States to study. I will be coming back to Afghanistan. And some have been successful and some have not been, but that's one of the challenges that we have to overcome. And in the last two years, we've had, we've had a lot of students come into the US, um, but you know the challenge is there, so I just kind of wanna raise it. Um, again, as my panelists were talking about the different routes of you can come here, these, these opportunities on F1, J1, require extensive amount of extensive amount of work and requirements. So you wanna, you know, consider that option if you're doing it to be in the long run. I think my first co-panelists talked about resilience and patience. Um and, and these processes are taken. We have a lot of people who have applied and they're still waiting for this process. So uh for the F1, you know, you have to get accepted by the credential programs, you have to pay their fees. Uh, complete the form, schedule the interview, and then attend the interview. Um, and so I don't want to spend too much time on this part of it because I want to save for the questions everybody has. But these are sort of the steps that you have to take in terms of getting an F-1 student visa. Um, and the fees are like around $350 and, and there may be some more costs. A lot of people contact me again, you know, asking about the F-1. If they get here and they can't afford it, um, unlike the J-1, there's not two-year requirement. So I've had many clients who came in. Just last week, I had someone that I met at a local mosque who said she came a week before in an F-1. She thought that the school was going to help her pay the full tuition and also living costs. The school said, no, we're not going to pay for all of that. You have to pay. 
So unfortunately, she had to drop out, but then she turned around and she's filing for asylum. But they did ask her all those questions about your intent to return back to Afghanistan and, and all of that stuff, and she was able to overcome it. So the goal is to come here and study. So if you're doing one of these nursing professions, obviously, you know, everybody in Afghanistan, everybody around the world wants to come to the U.S. If you have an opportunity to come in on an F-1, which is not as restricted as a J-1, but if you come on an F-1, the hope is, is that you continue your education because without that education, you're not going to be able to work in the field that you're looking for. And you have to find the ways to support that, that education that you're going to be having. Um, so again, the forms are DS-160, you know, paying the fees, the application, and the USCIS website and maybe all the various other sites uh, have information on how you do the process. Uh, and then you have to schedule the interview at the consulate. So if you're applying from Afghanistan, one of the things is that, um, you know, getting a visa to any country is very difficult. Again, you know, I have hundreds of Afghani clients and, um, and the challenge is, is for them to get an interview. And in order to get an interview at another, you first have to file it and you'll get a KBL number. And then you have to get a visa to another country in order to transfer and have an interview at an embassy. So some of my clients have been able to get to Pakistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Qatar, uh, Ankara. So you will have to attend the interview. And then again, you have to prove that you intend to return back to Afghanistan that you're not gonna stay in the United States because that's what the intent of the F1 is. And again, you have to have a valid passport, photos, copies of all your documents, your transcripts, your school records, your diploma, and you have to have proof. So maybe you have a family member in the United States who's going to support you for your education. You have to give their financial documents to prove that you have somebody to support you when you come to the United States. Um, and for those who come on F1 and then they can't afford it and they think they may get help from the government, food costs, living costs, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to get that help from the government because you came on an F1 or a J1. So those opportunities are, are going to be very limited for you. Um, the next, so during the interview, again, they're going to ask for your academic credentials, your tests, your evidence to leave and stay and your ability to pay for your costs. Um, what to expect? Um, they're gonna look at it to see whether, whether you're a legitimate student, whether you have resources, and again, do you plan on returning to back home? That is a very, very big issue that we're seeing. Um, and then also about why you picked this university, why did they pick you, how will you pay, do you have relatives in the United States, and on an F-1 student visa, unlike J-1, you cannot work. Um, so, you know, you can't, you can't have an intent to come in and be able to, to work. So um, these, are, these are the different, the slides will be shared. These are the different uh, portals that you can go into in terms of getting help for the programs and all of that. Um, in terms of certification, for J-1, the, again, the forms are the DS-219. For the F-1, it's the I-120 is the, the, the documents. As I mentioned, uh, J-1, you're allowed to work part-time while you're on it. And if you're on a break, you can work full-time. Uh, F-1 students can work um, on OPT. So if they have certain, um, you know, if they have, if they're given the privilege to be able to work, they may be able to work. But in general, uh, there are restrictions. F1 students cannot work, but they can enroll in a part-time study program. There might be some stampeds or some grants or some money that they may give you. So that's a very big difference between the J1 and the F1 that um, work is very limited with the, the F1 visa. Um, again, funding sources for the J1 must come from the accredited institution or the nonprofit. And for the F1, you can be, you know, your friend. If you have a friend in the United States, if a fi uh, institution, a nonprofit, or somebody wants to fund you, your education, you can certainly explore those options. Um, the the third option is an H1B non-immigrant visa. Those are very very specific to the skills you have. So if you're applying for a certain job. If there's a job in the United States and they post that job, then your credentials have to match with that job. 
And if there are certain jobs that the demand is high, once you've been selected and matched up with the job and your credentials, then you may go through a lottery system to get a, you know, selected for that job. So it could be in technology, finance, engineering, it could be in, in you know, physician, uh, medical field, but the criteria for the H-1B, when you get the non-immigrant visa years from now, that, that in itself can lead to a, to a green card, which means you can stay legally in the US. But the H-1B again is very restricted in terms of the, the job title, and your skills and they have to match. So for example, from India or Asian countries, they bring in engineers and they have to match their credentials uh, with their skills. So H-1Bs are possible. I have not seen that many of H-1Bs for Avans, um, just because it's not the sector of the population that usually applies for these. But that if you have you know, the credentials that match and you find a job, it's always a possibility. So I'm not discouraging anyone from filing, it is just a little bit harder. And then these are certain requirements. Um, like I mentioned, if it's a high sought out job, you may have to go through once you've matched with the job, you have to do a lottery and a number of people get selected and you can apply. The last one, uh, the last of the one is the EB-3. It's under employment based and there's EB-3A, EB-3B, EB-3C. And those are skilled workers, professionals, and other workers. Um, and so they have to, they, they have the ability to bring their children under 21 and not married, and their spouses and they're legally married. And it gives you the ability once you're here on a certain job, if you find another job similar, you can switch jobs. So I haven't seen that many EB3s. And again, uh, Dr. Chen, I didn't want to spend too much time talking about it because I want to leave the floor open for, for everyone to talk. But EB3 are like skilled workers um, who have at least two years. EB3s are like uh, US bachelor's degree or equivalent. EB3 are um, unskilled laborers that may be able to come in and do some work. But these, um, again, I have not seen that many from Afghanistan. Um, there's labor certification, there's an application form, there's a visa application. And so those are the different various programs that are mostly available for, for Afghans uh, that are able to possibly apply and, and come into the United States. Dira manana, tashakur, inshallah, me information, barishma rasid, information ziyatasta, that did information was my task at Shiriku, Katasa Sawalari, Kawalis chat box, Kiwachu, Yak questions on Lari, Makibuiz, Manana. Thank you. Natasha Kor, excuse me. Uh, that was a really fantastic talk, great overview of the different, uh, and that it's, a, it's kind of a really dizzying array of visas, and it's very, very complicated, still get very confused between like H1, H1Bs and EB3s and H. F1s, J1s, just a kind of a, a alphabet soup there. Um, I'm going to invite now um, people to just submit your questions. If you can use the tab called Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom. And if we could ask all the speakers to come back on camera, we can have all yeah. of you up as well. And then Eliza is going to kind of organize, kind of curate those questions, and then you'll read them then, I guess, right, Eliza? Actually, I'm going to try to spotlight everybody. So if you want to grab a few, that would be oh, good. okay. Okay. Um, yeah, that, I mean, so there's a there's a great question from from uh, Kamula um, Wardak. Should we admit in the short term visa interview that we have relatives in the U.S. or not? And I guess that's a question for Spojmi. Uh, I guess that would probably depend on the type of visa, would it? I mean, if for for, for example, for an F one, would you want people? Would you want the embassy to know that you have, you know, all these family in the United States that you might be living with after you're done with your studies, or does that go away? Go go against your so called intent to leave um, proof. Well, my motto is: you always, always, always want to be honest. Right. Never, even if information that's going to hurt you, you want to be honest. Because if they discover something you're hiding, that's fraud, misrepresentation, you know, permanently barred. Uh, second of all, if that depends on the family member. So um, if, if you're a young person and your parents are in the United States, 
it might go against you, or it might be that your parents have money or your brothers and sisters have money and they're able to finance your education. Because for F1, you have to support yourself. So whether it's gonna hurt you or not, if you have family members, you need to say yes, um, because they may be able to look it up. And I've seen that more often than not. So the short answer is yes, if you have family members and they ask you, be honest, whether it hurts you or doesn't hurt you. Right, right. Um, kind of a flip side of that question, uh, supposedly, is if what if you have um, family outside of the United States? I think you were talking about Turkey. Maybe the person's not actually from Turkey. Maybe they're in Turkey now. They're applying for this F, there's this F1 to come to the United States. Um, or, or maybe they're in Afghanistan and they need to kind of how somehow it's going to be very difficult for them to prove that they're going to come back to Afghanistan when they're done with their studies in the United States. But if they have family, say, for example, in the UK or Germany, could that be somehow leveraged to prove that their intent after they're done with their studies in the United States? Maybe it's instead of going back to Afghanistan, maybe it's to go back to Germany or to the UK if they have family. Is that is that something that you can do or is that? Um, so. Unless that individual has like status themselves, mm. I mean, that would possibly help. So if you're coming in and you say, well, my family is um, in Germany, uh, but I want to go to the United States to, to study, get my education, and I could potentially apply. So the Turkey example I gave you, one family had status in Turkey, the other one didn't. And they both got the visa, they, they both got the J-1 to come in here in San Jose State. Um, the one that didn't have um, a visa to stay long-term in, uh, in Turkey, the answer to how I prepared her, and it was a pro bono case, I prepared her, I said, say that, you know, with your credentials, you have the ability to go back to Turkey because you've already got a visa one time. So you can potentially say, well, my family's in this country, um, I could potentially get a visa to go visit them there and do you know more work there. You can say that it may, may or may not hurt. The other thing is is um, just being honest always, and 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 I know there's a lot of hope and uh, people you know are desperate to get out. Islamabad is notoriously a difficult embassy to deal with, whether you're doing marriage cases, fiance cases, any kind. So if you can avoid that embassy, particularly for like F ones and J ones and go somewhere else that would be a good thing to do. Uh, someone asked me, if you come to the J J1, but I want to apply for asylum, is that a problem? Well, once you're here, you're going to have to talk to an immigration attorney to figure out how you're going to overcome the two-year residency requirement and then be able to pursue asylum. Um, but you cannot have a pre-existing intent to say, I'm going to go to the US on a J1 or F1 or H-1B, and then I'm gonna apply for asylum. That's considered visa fraud. So if you're having that thoughts, you can discuss it when you're in the United States. But yes, I've had many people who overcame the two year applied for asylum eventually, but it's a lot of work, it's a process. That's a really great tip. I think the key thing you said there is, especially, is how important it is to always tell the truth because these things can come back and bite you. And yet visa fraud is, is just something you don't really you, you never want to get get caught in that. So, um, but it is in, it is current intent, right? Current intent to return to the to to Afghanistan or to leave the country, right? Um, let's see. Any other? So, Liza, do you want to pick out a, a um, yeah, question? There's, there's one there? um, question about the nursing pathway. Um, yeah. um, people who trained and got their license from private universities in Afghanistan are they eligible mm. to apply? Maybe that's a question for Nicole? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yes, any nurse, um, regardless of, you know, whether went to private school or, or a, a government school is eligible to apply. And then we'll look at the specifics of the school and the transcripts and the classes you took to determine whether you're eligible either for the visa screen for immigration or, you know, right in terms of writing the report for the state board for licensure. So absolutely. Great, thank you. Here's a question for um, Dr. Toro. Um, is there any support to find clinical observerships or research positions? Uh, a couple of people have asked about research opportunities. Sorry, can you repeat that? A um, question about uh, clinical observership opportunities or research position opportunities. Yeah, so uh, we actually are working in the ING initiative, trying to open those opportunities right now. We're just beginning the project, but 
try to connect with us and we can guide you. Um, there, is, there are resources, there are places for serverships, there are actually hospitals that have established programs and you can apply to those, but um, as everything, uh, it costs money. So you need to be aware of that. Uh, there are also, that is something like what I did with Dr. Shin. So we connected through AMWA and because he's in a private practice is, I think it was easier maybe to have me visiting, you know, like uh, shadowing him. So sometimes for hospitals, like big hospitals, let's say Mayo Cleveland Clinic, it's kind of hard because of the legal part of it. Uh, you are liable and we are not insurance uh, insurance as medical doctors and the students. So that is something that you need to take into account. Now, research, there are places you can look in Indeed. You can look in uh, the career website of each university. Uh, you can look in LinkedIn. So there are, there are different places where you can look. Um, as I said, those three entry-level positions, jobs, I think that are really a good way to start. Actually, as I said, I'm a clinical research assistant. I do have a salary. It's a modest salary, but I do have a salary. So if you have a family, a family you're going to need that. Um, you can connect with me. I don't know, Dr. Ching, if you can uh, type down my Twitter account or my email. I, I also put it in the last slide. So um, because I cannot, I try, but I cannot type in the chat. So um, you can connect with me also through LinkedIn and I will try to direct you to the best resources. Right, and I think Tamar, you had your hand up. Yes, yeah, I was gonna add to what Dr. Toro said that I've worked with folks who've been able to through networks find doctors like I guess Dr. Chin who've been willing to take on um, observers and externships and shadowing. Um, so there is some degree of um, of flexibility, um, and when that really um, emphasizes Dr. Toro's um, comments about how important networking is and, and being connected and talking to people um, to find folks who are willing to support you on this complicated journey. Excuse me. Um, I just wanted to answer the question in the chat. Someone said, you know, I, they cannot work if they have asylum. Um, actually, when somebody applies for asylum, so we have had, um, so the Afghans that were paroled in, they had a pathway of being paroled and they have a work permit. But Afghans who have come in through Mexico or Brazil area, uh, once they apply for asylum, they have to wait 150 days, then they can apply for a work permit. So those who get asylum do have a way to get a work permit eventually. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that if you, you know, if you somehow come in through the southern border through Mexico or somewhere to the U.S. and you apply for asylum, once you apply, you have to wait 150 days before you can apply for a work permit. And that work permit will allow you to work in the U.S. I just wanted to clarify that. And just in the chat, there are a lot of people who were interested in contacting you, but did you want to clarify, um, you know, how you want to direct some of those questions so your office doesn't get flooded? So I'd be happy to put my email. The email is directly to me. I will respond to questions as fast as I can. They'll be directed to me. So I'll put my email um, for anybody who has follow-up questions. But again, as I said earlier, I'm not able, I don't have the capacity right now to take on any of these cases. So I'm happy to answer people that may have questions related to immigration only. I don't have any experience with all of the requirements that all these awesome speakers have. I'll just uh, the immigration. So I'll put um, so I'll just put my uh, email in the chat box. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And there's uh, been two questions about someone having an ECFMG certificate and how that might help um, with applications. Um, does somebody want to comment on that? Oh, you do need the ECFMG certification to apply. Are you talking about the MASH, the residency MASH, or are, something or... about an EB one visa? And there's another question about a oh, okay, one case. Yeah, I don't know, Miss Nasiri, if you know about this, but um, for the visas, uh... yeah, that's a great question. Actually, it's a great question for Swajni. So you, you talk about H one Bs and. It's there or, or EB3s. I think there were, there were certain visa categories for skilled labor, 
And so you would think that like a doctor in Afghanistan is a neurosurgeon in Afghanistan. He's like great skilled labor. He has this great skill of being able to operate and open people's heads and operate on brains, right? But he obviously cannot, or she cannot obviously come to the United States because they've got to go through all this licensure stuff. But there are probably other things like um, surgical tech, for example, or medical assistance. So um, it just seems the requirement for, for the, the category of being H-1B as a skilled laborer, it might not be open because there are all these certification barriers, right? Is that is that right? But Correct. yeah. It, is there a possibility to come to the United States, you know, as a surgical tech, tech, will they give a certain grace period for you to have like a month to take the test to get your certification for, to become a surgical tech or something like that? Or do you immediately have to, you already have to be certified? You have to meet the requirements. So there's a job description and then there's the requirements and they have to match up. So um, they have, they have to have already had all the credentials. You're applying for that job. There's no grace period. It's very, very restricted. But like you said, maybe EB, EB, in the EB categories, there may be a skilled labor job that you are able to. But even in those, you have to meet the, meet the full requirement. They won't give you a leeway to say, okay, well, when you come in, you can do it and then we'll let you in. The purpose of it is to match the requirements with the credentials you already have. So we are over time. <laughs> want to respect uh, the speakers and thank you for spending um, this time with us. For some of you, I know it's the evening. Um, just wanted to thank you all. The recording um, will be shared with all attendees um, and um, the speakers who um, are willing to share their emails. We will also share that as well. Uh, I just fixed for speakers and panelists. I discovered why you were not able to message the group. So I just fixed that. Um, and if I haven't been able to forward all your messages, feel free to put something in the chat. Thank you very much. I just want to thank all the speakers who have been very generous for their time and your expertise. It's really so, so helpful. We're getting so many messages about how helpful you guys have been. And uh, this is a real, real need. I uh, I just want to emphasize, you know, I've gotten to do a lot of great things as a doctor, saving lives and saving arms and things like that. But I will tell you the the greatest honor of my lifetime has been to stand with the people of Afghanistan. Uh, uh, and I will help you any way I can if any of you wants to reach out to me. So thank you very much. And thank you again to panelists. Thank you again to all so the much. speakers. Thank you to OET for supporting this event. Uh, thank you all of you for attending. Um, this had started out as something planned for uh, US folks. And so we um, now realize we can think differently about time zones when we set up the next one. And we hope to ho set up some networking events following up with this. So thank you all so much. Um, we welcome any of the physicians here to get involved with um, AMWA. Dr. Shayla Toro is the one who helped launch this initiative, basically coming to us with her own story. And so we want to support all of you on your journeys. And we would love to have a physician interest group um, uh, with Afghan physicians. So please do reach out to us. Thank you again, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.